Uh, I'm lucky to be joined by a great panel. We are missing one individual who uh, was not feeling too well this morning, so he decided to sit out. But uh, as far as how to break into venture capital, I think we have a great panel nonetheless. I'm actually going to pass it around so everyone can introduce themselves. And I'd like to start with Kim Patel. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Brandon. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm super excited. Thank you, Stephanie and the crew for um, everything. Uh, so I am currently a uh, venture capital investor at Sound Ventures. Um, I'm also finishing up my MBA at Harvard Business School right now. Um, prior to this, I worked for three other venture capital firms in a fellowship or venture partner capacity. So that means that I, um, I wasn't working for the firm full time, but was really focused on scouting and sourcing for deals uh, for, for those firms. So they were Lair Hippo, which is a seed stage firm in New York City, Alley Corp, which is another seed stage firm and incubator in New York City, and Harlem Capital, which is a uh, investor focused on diverse um, entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs um, in the early stage. Um, and then, you know, spent six years as the media executive in New York City working for companies like Vice and the Huffington Post um, and started my career out as an investment banker. Thank you. And I want to pass it off to Eli Blaskis. Uh, thanks, Brandon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and great to be, um, you know, trying to share our knowledge with the Boston community, the New England community. I'm Eli Velasquez. I'm the director of venture, uh, venture development at an organization called VentureWell. We're based in the Amherst, Massachusetts area, and our primary aim is moving sci early stage science and technology to market. Um, through that initiative, we make small investments or seed stage investments um, in early stage science and tech companies, predominantly coming out of the uh, university research labs and incubators, accelerators, things of that nature. Um, I am also on the board of the Angel Capital Association. That's the world's largest association of accredited angel investors. Um, and helping to lead their diversity initiatives. Um, my background is varied uh, from mechanical engineering to IP law. Um, I also work for the, uh, an organization, I had set, started up an organization that was vetting deals uh, for the state of Texas' venture fund. It was called the Texas Emerging Technology Fund, um, a $200 million fund that was looking to make investments in early stage science and tech. And then lastly, I, uh, in my day job, I head up a program in partnership with the US State Department um, to help build uh, investor networks in other countries. So I've had the opportunity to do this in Colombia, Mexico, Egypt, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So it's been interesting to see the different perspectives of different ecosystems trying to build out investment communities. So again, happy to share and happy to be here. Thank you. Finally, uh, Basil. Hi, uh, Basil Alamari. Um, currently investing with Primary Venture Partners in New York City, uh, also wrapping up my MBA at Columbia Business School. Uh, prior to CBS, I was an early stage operator. It was the first business I'd hired a company called Simon Data. Uh, I was there from C to Series C, helped build out uh, the growth teams as, as the head of growth. Um, so everything from sales ops to lead gen and everything else in between. Um, while at business school, I had the chance to work with a handful of different funds, including 406 Ventures uh, in Boston, uh, and then the Riverside Company, which is a sort of large PE fund, uh, primarily looking at uh, pretty early stage uh, debt deals. Um, but yeah. Thank you. And then again, my name is Brandon Oliver. I am the operations director here for the BCU FinTech Innovation Center, which is a nonprofit startup accelerator focusing primarily or exclusively on financial tech companies, moving them from conceptual stage all the way to uh, early growth, customer traction, and eventually, hopefully, onto pre-seed round funding. Um, our main goal is always to help these companies find product market fit. But being in this space and able to speak with many angel groups, venture capitalists, private equity firms, very excited to be moderating this panel. And without further ado, we're going to dive right in. Uh, we're actually going to start off with focusing on the mindset of a VC. So I'm actually going to turn it back on to Basil, and I'm going to ask, you know, how would you describe kind of high-level the mindset of a venture capitalist or what they should have as a mindset moving into an industry like this. Yeah. And, and, and like uh, I'd sort of uh, preface anything I'll say by saying most of this is just observing some of the, the, the best folks I've worked with. And I think a lot of it has been uh, embodying a mindset of, of constantly looking for opportunities, whether passively or actively every sort of, uh, and, and, and that's not to say like interactions with our people are, are purely transactional. Uh, but every sort of uh, interaction is the uh, opportunity to help somebody else, uh, to get introduced to somebody else, 
to fund someone, to find something else, to learn something. And I think the the, the best folks I've, I've worked with, and uh, Brad's for Luga, who's the sort of B two B partner at Primary, comes to mind here, um, is is really sort of embodied that mentality and and that and that mindset. And so, Kim, I want to turn to you and ask, you know, why is that mindset of being so opportunistic so valuable, not just for a VC, but really anyone going towards any industry, whether it's in the financial field, uh, financial field or elsewhere? Yeah, so I have had a few pivots of my own throughout my career. Um, and so I will say, like, having gone through different phases before I even stepped into VC, um, that mindset was already ingrained in me from my previous jobs and I didn't even realize it until I got to VC and realized I was like wow like all of my past experience actually applies um, in terms of like operating and even working in, in, in finance and so I think the big piece of it is, is that when you're in a lot of these roles at least on the business side whether that's operating an early stage startup or you know mid-sized company or in a bank like JP Morgan which is where I first started um, you're always building relationships with people like building relationships is a part of anyone's job I don't care if you're an engineer an assistant or a janitor like you are interacting with people on an everyday basis and those interactions especially when you know it's whether it's your colleagues or your boss or the client you're working for um, they usually want them to be positive interactions that requires you to be somewhat you know your authentic self to, to bring your personality to the table to be a friendly person but it also requires you to add a little bit of value and whatever conversation you're having, it, not in the sense of like, I can do this for you, but in the sense of you have, you're interested in something that I'm also interested in, let's talk about it. Maybe there's something that we may be able to do, something interesting we find out about that thing that we both like to talk about. Maybe it's that we both, even if it's like something that's occasionally like a, it's the same coffee shop we like to visit or like the same artists that we like or the same musician, or it can be this industry is really interesting. And like, I want to know more about it. Like, it seems like, you know, a lot about healthcare. It could be either one of those spectrums, but regardless, you just found like a grounding moment for somebody to build a relationship with you. And those relationships will follow you for the rest of your career, for the rest of your life. So a lot of my professional contacts in VC, are now friends of mine because we now collaborate and have a rapport together and trust each other and like to work together. And I think that can be translated to any industry. Excellent. And so now Eli, now that we kind of have an idea of the, the mindset that we might want to have, when you look at a partner or even yourself, when you work within the industry, you know, what do you think makes a successful VC? Is it strictly the number of deals closed? Is it ROI? Or is there something more to it? Yeah, obviously you're going to be looking at, at metrics and success rate because ultimately you're beholden to your, your LPs and your stakeholders. Um, but, but I think, you know, along the lines of, of the mindset is, is these two concepts of, of one, you have to be a people person like Kim is, is talking about. And so if you're anti-people and if you don't like people, VC is not the industry for you um, because you will be working with people every single day and you're, you'll be working with very quirky, you know, founders that are bringing you some really, really funky ideas. And, you know, it's your job to be professional and respectful and polite of those ideas, whether they're a fit for you or not. Um, so, so, you know, to be successful in the VC industry, you, ha you have to be authentic, right? You have to be yourself and, and you can't put up pretenses um, just because you carry a certain title or, or you work for a certain firm. Um, the other thing that makes you a successful investor is a philosophy that I learned very early on uh, vetting deals for the state um, was do the startup no harm. You know that that's that's a philosophy that that I've adopted um, early on, and and to, you know to the extent that I can be helpful beyond just the investment. Um, you know the idea is to try to get as many of these deals moving in a direction, whether that's a quick to fail direction or a quick to success direction. But there there's an opportunity to also help guide them toward a nice easy off ramp. Um, if you're if you're good at what you're doing, so you know I think those those individuals that demonstrate those qualities are those individuals that make for successful VCs. And ultimately, you know, like Basil's saying, they will naturally draw opportunities to them because you want to do business with them. So now, if I'm a student and now I'm on the fence on if I want to get involved in the VC game, it's a, it's a journey I might want to go on. And when I say the word student, I'm using that very liberally, right? It could be someone who's just out of school. It could be someone who's further on in their career. 
uh, who's thinking about now jump, making that jump into the venture capital industry, you know, give me, I'd like all three of you to kind of give me your quick elevator pitch, 30 seconds, as to why someone should want to be a VC. And the reason why I ask is because being in this particular industry, you get to hear a lot of pitches from a lot of very unique founders, unique companies. And I think on one hand, it's interesting to see how you prefer a pitch to go based on your example of one um, for an industry that you are closely tied to. So I'm going to pick it right on here. I'm actually going to go with Kim first, if she just wanted to do, put 30 seconds on the clock and give me your quick pitch as to why someone would want to be a VC. If you want to be excited by every conversation you have with somebody because their idea could be about launching a rocket to Mars or it could be about a better way for you to get your dinner every day, at, you know, it could be anything, then you should get, and if you're somebody who's driven by curiosity, you should be a VC. How about uh, Basil? For me, at least, it is the perfect balance between extroverted work and, and, and deeply analytical introverted work. And you can go from having 10 coffees in a day or Zoom calls now with people and meeting rate, exciting, interesting people solving some of the problems that Kim mentioned as an example to going and working on a thesis and, and thinking about hard stuff and, and trying to help guide your portfolio. And it's, it's interesting and exciting to oscillate between those two. And finally, Eli? Um, if you like sleepless nights, uh, reading tons of, yeah. of pitch decks, um, working with really crazy founders, putting yourself through absolute misery at times, uh, venture capital is definitely the place for you. Because at the end of the day, it's not as fun as it looks, but it's incredibly fun <laughs> as it looks. Right, guys? Yeah. Excellent. So I am seeing a couple of questions roll in. I am going to save uh, the questions that are brought to us by the public until the last 15, 20 minutes. Um, that way, people have enough time to ask questions or think about anything they want to ask near the end. So now that, okay, we went through the mindset. You give me your pitches. I'm sold on jumping into the industry. Uh, I'm going to turn to Basil. Basil, what's the, what's the roadmap that gets me there? As If I'm a, at any point in age, right, how do I get started moving into this particular industry? Yeah, I mean, I think it takes a, an incredible level of self-awareness sort of to, to think about what are the skills, uh, hard and soft, that, that you have, the, the, the sort of likes and interests that you have, and what are you missing? And, and that will dictate what the next step looks like for you. So for me personally, uh, spent six years in, in tech and, and operating and, and managing and felt like I'm good at managing people. I'm, I'm good at sort of getting down in the weeds and, and getting things done. And, and uh, But didn't have any background in sort of financial modeling or uh, doing anything sort of deeply analytical or reading a you know, very candidly like an income statement. So I figured, okay, how do I fill that gap? Um, you know, business school for me personally was one way to do that. The other thing I realized was I had a great network of, of folks in startups and, and VC in New York all in sort of B2B SaaS, which may or may not be where I want to spend the rest of my career, but you know, I didn't want to pigeon my whole myself just yet. It turns out that's like all the VC work I've done is in that, so maybe I double down there, but still, I think it requires figuring out where you are and where you want to be, and, and uh, the, the thing that will fill that gap is different from everybody, for everybody. It may, you know, maybe you should go start something first. Maybe you, um, you should go be an entrepreneur in residence somewhere. Maybe you go intern with a fund. Uh, It'll, I think that looks very different for everybody, but it requires sort of a little bit of introspection as, as a first step. Yeah, and Basil, you and I talked about it earlier in the week where it is different for depending on where you are in your career. So, Eli, let's just take like three different examples of an individual that could possibly want to go into the venture capital game. Let's say I am someone who's coming right out of school versus someone who's been maybe five to 10 years out of school versus someone who's 10 to 20 years out of school. You know, what is something that is actionable that I should do at each certain stage in my career that may put me in a better light that moves me into a, a VC firm later on? Yeah, I think at any of those stages, um, I think the underlying components of it is you have to at least try some form of startup in some capacity. Like you, you have to give it a shot, right? And you have to, to be able to tell your story as an operator, be able to tell your story as a founder. Um, because then you understand what the other side is dealing with. Um, two, I always say, you know, there, there is no shortage of deal flow, period. I mean, the, you get it on LinkedIn, you get it in your email, you get it in your platforms. 
Um, so raise your hand and say, look, I'm happy to just look at deals just to get practice and, and understand what it is I should be looking for. Cause it's only by doing that, they should call it the practice of venture capital as well. Right? Like, like your legal practice, your medical practice should be your investment practice. And it really takes muscle um, to, 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 to make it work. Right. You have to build that investment muscle. So no matter what stage you're at now, if you're coming later on in your career, you know, then you also want to demonstrate what are the different facets of your career where you can bring value to the firm. Well, I've, I've actually managed the team. Okay. That might be interesting for us to incorporate. I have a big network of X, Y, Z in the FinTech sector. Okay. That would be interesting for us to bring to the, to the table. So, so I think, you know, rolling up your sleeves is, is the most important part across these different facets. But you have to be able to tell the story. In my case, one of the early organizations, I had to fish my desk out of a dumpster, right? Because we didn't have office furniture. And that was, that's part of the story that you get to tell with founders. So you definitely have to, have to get in there and get in the mix with them. And then Kim, so the other flip side of the coin is really what are the, the pitfalls, right? What are the things to kind of avoid that can really dampen your spirit and make it tough for you to make a successful career within VC. So along the way, you know, we talked about it during our session earlier this week. What are some of those things that um, students or anyone in their career should really avoid doing if this is something they know they want to get into? Yeah, so I will say that it's really easy to get burnt out um, even when you're trying to get into the space as much as you're when you're in the space. And I would say that one thing is, is that don't try to be an expert in everything. The thing with VC is, is that you can literally explore any industry under the sun and talk to hundreds of founders and look at hundreds of pitch books and do a ton of research. But ask yourself, like, what is it that you're interested in? So when I was first approaching this idea of going to VC, I knew that I didn't really know exactly what industry I was, was super interested in, but I knew that I worked in media and I, I liked consumer focused businesses, but what I was really more passionate about was working with female founders. I was really excited to work with other really interesting, curious, um, passionate women. Um, and so I went after a fund that was actually focused on that. So it doesn't always have to be that I really wanted to do only consumer businesses or I like food tech or whatever it was. I was really passionate about this thing and then I went after it and that way I was able to kind of narrow in on things that I was interested in so I wasn't just scouring the earth. And I think that's really important because if you do do that, in conversations you can come across as if you don't know what you want or that you don't really know what you're interested in or that you have no interest. And like, that's not the perception that you're probably trying to portray but can come off that way. So definitely like do research and think about what you're interested in and what kind of companies you would want to work with but it doesn't have to be everything. You don't have to know everything about every industry. I definitely don't, and I'm in the industry, so. Well, yeah, and that's something we spoke about as well, with all, I spoke about with all three of you. The vastness of this industry is becoming increasingly exponentially greater every single day. There's so many niche firms out there, there's so many specific things and investment memorandum that they go after that it can be very overwhelming to someone who's just entering, figuring out what they want to do. Um, so, Basil, you got a great point, really. Know yourself, right? Know exactly what you want. Kim, you spoke about, you know, doing your research. And Eli, you, you, you mentioned, you know, making sure that it is right for you no matter what. Uh, so, given all of that, talk about a little bit about the future of VC. And this is something I'm going to pose to all three of you, and I'll, I'm going to start with Eli. You know, what do you see as some of the – it could be things you're seeing as trends. It could be things that you're noticing that just with the industry itself – areas that are being developed further and things that you might be a little bit afraid of with the VC industry going forward? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Brandon. I had an opportunity to be on a, on a webinar last week um, with a group of congressional staffers. And, and I got that question specifically is what, if you could do this all over, what would it look like? Um, and I said, we need a, we need a reset on venture capital. We need a VC 2.0 um, because the model for venture capital was built uh, by a certain asset class for a certain kind of entrepreneur, for a certain kind of company in a certain kind of geography. Um, so I'm, I'm alluding everything here towards Silicon Valley focused type of companies and, and that ecosystem, and I'm not, I'm not blaming or shaming them, that ecosystem works for them. Um, if you have an opportunity to, to live there and work there, you see how, how they operate and it's its own micro, uh, microcosm, right? Um, and it works. 
so, but you can't just take that model and apply it everywhere. And I think that's been the challenge as we've looked at venture capital in, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, or, or Atlanta, Georgia, um, or even Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so, so from a cultural perspective, you know, we have to look at where the economics of our country is going, where are our founders building? They're building in black and Latinx uh, founders, specifically black and Latin, black and Latinas. Um, and so, so black women and Latinas, that's the fastest growing market of entrepreneurs. And so they are building the economy by the businesses that they're starting and venture capital is not a direct fit. That's why black women over the last 10 years have acquired 0 0.0006. That's three zeros um, after the decimal point of venture capital over the last 10 years. That's shameful. Um, and, but, but that's indicative of the fact that we need to change the model for how we make those investments because the companies that we would invest in are not going to exit the way that the traditional venture capital investments exit. They're not going to make the big pop. Why? Because culturally, we like to pass our businesses on to the next generation. So we are building what would be called lifestyle type business, but that's not a shameful word if we look at how we can actually maximize our investment returns through that, whether we look at alternative investment instruments, revenue-based financing, you know, milestone-driven returns, things of that nature that are much more entrepreneur-friendly is how I think we need to be looking at venture capital. And then the second thing is we need to get more people of color into the venture industry um, and, and, and really help disseminate the, the flow of capital beyond the two coasts and into middle America um, and across the Southeast and Southwest. You look at the numbers, I mean, up there in Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, there's nothing, right? Um, but but you really, we really have to get more money flowing into all of these ecosystems. Those are definitely two different approaches that I think would hope that we could help drive policy initiatives to shift how we, how we develop and redesign venture capital. It definitely has been a shift and you're right where you're seeing a lot more people start their own funds right from the outset um, with those different types of investment criteria, those new ways of thinking. Um, and so it, it would be interesting to see, you know, how that fares out over the next five to 10 years and how the VC world changes. So Baz, I'm going to pass it off to you. Kind of same question. The trends you're seeing right now, things to look out for within the industry as a whole. Yeah. And, and I think there are, there are obviously a bunch, but uh, sort of to Eli's point, I, I think, um, and, and I think it aligns with the, the point that you're making of people going out and starting super small niche funds that may take different approaches to venture. Like that's what gets us from here to there is um, if the sort of traditional uh, firms and funds don't see opportunities, whether it's in a particular market, whether it's a particular community, whatever it might be, that's a, a phenomenal opportunity for someone who does sort of believe in those niches to go and say, I'm going to go raise $50 million to, to go make investments there. It, and it doesn't necessarily have to be community oriented. It can, you know, when I was at Riverside, um, we did revenue-based financing for uh, startups and a lot of them in the Midwest, some in Australia, where they just don't have the same venture ecosystem and they're not going to have billion dollar exits. And that's totally fine. You can have a great outcome with a hundred million dollar exit. Like that is a, a great business. Um, it just changes how you think about financing. Uh, aside from that, I, I think um, what, what I'm seeing more and more of is uh, funds incubating ideas internally, right? Especially with um, more and more sort of, I'll call them ridiculous, but obviously that's sort of my value judgment, but higher valuations of, of startups, particularly uh, sort of B2C, uh, B2C companies where you're going off of metrics that can, can be uh, pretty, pretty ridiculous and not necessarily tied to cash flow. And so I, I think funds are going to say, hey, I, there's no way that I'm ever going to make money taking 10% of this at, at exit 20 years from now. But, you know, we've got some great ideas. We know some great entrepreneurs. Why don't we incubate something internally? Um, we're seeing that at primary. I've, I've seen that from a bunch of other funds in, in New York, and I think it'll, it'll only continue to be the case. And Kim, same question. So, um, you know, to, to Basil's point, like I, I was at a firm that its entire thesis was to incubate companies and be like 50% of the co-founder and then like be take essentially have half equity in the companies that they incubated and then and then the other side of the business was just investing in other startups. Um, I think, you know, I started out my career in venture focused on minority founders and and women um, specifically because they are underrepresented to um, Eli's point. And you know, one of the things that I am have been thinking about lately is really the notion of how founders even like the process of how founders even get 
funded. Um, and a big part of that is actually democratizing what we call a soft introduction, meaning like you need to know somebody to know somebody to get an introduction to a venture capital firm to get funded in the first place. And as much as, um, you know, everyone's like, oh, I'll take a cold email, that's not really what happens. It's not sustainable on a day-to-day -day basis and people just don't really do it because it's not a habit that's been built in. I have been working with folks to essentially try to create tools that allow founders and investors to get matched in a less um, subjective way, which maybe then helps like democratize what that soft intro might look like. So it's still being vetted, like the, the investor knew that it was vetted by something, whether it was a person that has a matching tool or is like doing all the introductions. I myself do that a lot with founders I will meet and then I will source them to other funds all the time. And a big part of that is also for you to understand like what everybody's looking for. I think the other tough part is if you're a founder in North Dakota or if you're a founder in California, you also, there's so many funds out there, you don't know where to even start. Who am I pitching to? Who should I be talking to? Is this the right fit? Is this the right check size? All of these variables. Um, and so you kind of need these like intermediaries and whether that's like people with this talk because you need a network or if that's something that's a tool that somebody that everybody has access to um that's something that that's a trend i've been seeing that i'm really excited about um because it just helps even the playing field and so there seems to be a trend you know there's, there's a new way of thinking around venture capital and, and angel investing in general uh there's a new wave of thinking as it relates to uh, minority founders whether they're starting their own firms starting their own companies and a lot of the issues that uh, a candidate would have trying to get into a VC firm is the same issues that an entrepreneur would have when speaking to this VC firm to get funding. And so thinking along those lines, you know, what are, uh, how can a candidate who's going out to say an analyst associate position, maybe going in as a, a potential VP or a uh, partner, how can they argue on behalf of themselves similar to a way an, an entrepreneur would when trying to get funding for the business, but in this case, they're trying to land the job, right? Because they have to convince this panel of potentially older money of this new thought process, this new way of thinking about potential investments and going forward. So I'm gonna circle back to Kim, cause you were just uh, on the roll yeah. there. So, so um, I, I've had to do that a few times uh, at multiple firms uh, with somebody who's never had venture experience. This is the one thing I will say about VC is that you don't actually have to work for a venture capital firm to do venture capital. And what I mean by, and you don't even have to have capital. So what I mean by that is honing your ability to understand like what might make a good founder what you what your thought is on like the future of a specific industry what um where you think a certain industry is going where you think what are what are good attributes of a company at at the earlier stages like what you should you be looking for there's so much content out there on the internet that you can actually teach some of this stuff to yourself and there are books that i can recommend for you to, to that i used to start out in my career but and i did it kind of like you know it was this it was basically learning everything on the street kind of thing. Like I was not in school learning about what is venture capital. Um, and I still don't learn it at business school. Just so you know, you won't learn that when you go, if you go to business school. Um, you can do all of those things and actually like build a reputation for yourself and build relationships. And in the past, it was going to events and going to conferences. Now we're online. But like I used, even in my job at a venture capital firm over the summer, I used Twitter to source my deals. I use Twitter to build relationships with investors. I'm cold DMing people. Be like, you have invested in this. This is really interesting. Would you have 15 minutes to talk to me about your thesis behind this investment? You are building this company. I found the I found the beta on my friend's like website, like beta link somewhere. Like it's really interesting. Can I sign up and use the product? Like that is literally what I was doing. And that I could have been doing that without my VC job or not. It's just because I'm interested and I want to learn. And so I think um, you can you can do that. Like that is at your fingertips. It's about taking initiative. If you are not somebody who knows how to take initiative without being told what to do, this isn't necessarily the right job for you. Right. And uh, Basil, you want to elaborate a little bit more? I mean, I think Kim hit the nail on the head. It's, it's about being comfortable working in ambiguity. It's about, you know, being okay and, and, and sending out that cold email, sending out that cold DM, and, and just uh, sort of one thing I've, I've, I've noticed about venture relative to sort of other industries that I've either worked in or had uh, 
the friends and family work in, it's sort of like an always on job. And that requires you to always be looking for, hey, someone tweeted about this thing that's in beta. Well, that's really cool. I know that the partner at this fund has made a bunch of fintech investments, you know, whatever. And it, and it looks a lot like this. Let me go talk to this person and let me go make that soft intro, right? Um, you can be incredibly valuable to funds uh, and, and, and partners and startups without being uh, a part of a fund. And, and all of a sudden, uh, if, if you're a partner at a fund and, and I've been sending you deal flow, it's real tough for you to not want to have me be an employee. It's, mm -hmm. it's real tough for, if, you know, if I go, hey, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, of going full-time into venture, I was gonna go interview at that firm or I'm interested in this firm, can you give me a, a, an intro? They're gonna be like, uh, I would love to have you come work here instead, right? So um, a great example is this, my fiance works in, in venture. She started interning with a fund uh, before starting B-School and just sort of hung around, helped them, sent them deals. Uh, had a bunch of those deals go to, to the investment committee and, and, and one get made. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, can you stay here after you graduate? Because it would be incredibly valuable for us. Uh, so just make yourself irreplaceable, I would say, and, and doing a lot of the things that Kim, Kim mentioned. Yeah, yeah I, could add, add I could add into that, Brandon. Yeah. You know, if you're getting laser eye surgery, do you want to go to the surgeon that's done one surgery or a thousand surgeries? Right. And, and so you have to, you know, you have to get in the, you have to get in the game uh, that, you know, people, people ask me, how do you, how did you get into this? And I never, I just have to say it's by accident, you know, because it, there's not one set career path. You just kind of meet somebody and then that leads to something else. But at the end of the day, you're, you're in the startup ecosystem, go where the startups at and venture capital and angel investors will be there. Um, so, so you have to position yourself in that space. Um, you know, going back to what other folks were saying was, you know, you, you do have to build some some professional or, or some professional acumen around a certain industry or two that you're interested in. So, um, you know, you want to learn, hey, look, I'm really into fintech or edtech or medical devices or whatnot. So start start engaging in that space. You know, to Kim's point, there's conferences. I, I, I get um, I get teased a lot because for some reason I wake up at three in the morning and then I start researching things and I'm on LinkedIn and then I start emailing them, texting them out and you know, I'm calling my friends and I'm like, did you get my text message? They're like, no, I turned off all my, all my notifications if they're coming from you, you know, I'll check them later. But, yeah. you know, it's that level of like, you're just in it. You have to be in it. You have to understand because the industry isn't, isn't a one size fits all. It's dynamic, right? And so you have to find what corner of the universe you want to go towards um, and aim for it. So, you know, I would encourage people that are out there, you know, you have three individuals here. You can find us on LinkedIn. You know, I'm happy to just engage in the conversation with you, you know, and I do that every single day of every single week with different folks, whether it's people that are on the on webinars, people that are online um, and you get to meet some really, really interesting people out of it. So, you know, roll up the sleeves and, and just get in the game. And I think that's a perfect point because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions come into the chat asking about, you know, how do I go on this linear path to get to where you are? And it's very clear there is none. Right. You mentioned it before. As long as you're in the ecosystem and you're networking and you're meeting these different individuals from all different sides, opportunities will arise. It's really up to you to recognize them in the moment, but at least you're putting yourself in a position to potentially see them. Um, the other thing you had a great segue towards was we did have one question come in, you know, kind of which books and resources would the three of you recommend in order to learn more about the industry um, or to stay abreast of the industry? I'll start with that, Eli. So, so like I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a deal guy. So I'm always trying to find where some of these VCs are investing in portfolios. So I, I go to the law firm, I'm sorry, the venture firms websites themselves, and I start researching their portfolio companies. Um, y Combinator just released their portfolio of black, um, Latinx and women funded companies. That's available online. Uh, you can go in there and start digging around. Um, so there's at least 67 companies that um, they've invested, I believe, in the in the uh, I'm sorry, in the black uh, African American space. Um, you can go in there and start looking at those deals if that's what you're interested in, and then you start parsing there out. Because even in the Latinx space, they have global deals. So if you're interested in global deals, you can start getting involved in those. So I I like to get under the hood and start understanding where money's moving, um, and then backtracking that to what that aligns with that investment thesis and making linkages across the board. So those are the key resources. Then of course there's just newsletters on Venture Beat, Venture Capital, PitchBook, Medium, Forbes, Inc. You know, you, you name it, it's always out there. 
And then how about Kim? Uh, what, what kind of books, resources would you recommend anyone should kind of stay updated with? So um, I do a lot of newsletters, a ton of newsletters. So a lot of really great investors, experienced investors, they have their own newsletters. Substack is huge. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a product where anyone can create their own newsletter. You can create your own newsletter. Um, but a lot of uh, seasoned investors also have their own, like they, when blogging was still a thing, um, when it's not on Medium, <laughs> used to blog and um, send out a lot of their posts. So. I follow Andreessen Horowitz's blog as a fund. Um, they always have pieces on like how they're thinking about things and new companies they've invested in. Um, I also uh, follow Alex Tossig on Lights, who's a Lightspeed venture partner, uh, a partner, um, and he's focused on consumer. So like that's really interesting to me. I also read Protocol, which is a great newsletter. Um, they're talking about everything that's going on. In the intersection of tech and politics, which now is becoming more relevant than ever. So it's not just about knowing what's happening in technology and VC, but like you kind of need to understand the intersection of things that are happening when people decide that TikTok can no longer be used by Americans. Like that's actually really relevant if you're focused on consumer tech. So um, uh, and can inform how you might think about people engaging with social media in the future. So there are having the ability to have that intersection. So it's not just about reading tech news, it's about being able to, to uh, digest bits of information across a few areas. Um, and so I would definitely say start with those. And Basil, any uh, folks resources you recommend? Yeah, like a lot of the, the things I've mentioned, I think are great, newsletters are great, um, definitely blogs by VCs. But I also think if you're not coming from a financial background, there's a lot of value in, in reading some of the sort of, uh, sort of like boring recommendation here, but like the classic books, like the venture deals or like the, you know, actually understand the, the, the economics that are in play when someone makes a venture investment. And why do people say, is this a billion dollar business? How do they land on that number? That feels like a really arbitrary number. And what does it mean to return the fund? And who are the LPs? And I just think it gives you a lot of context uh, when you go and, and, and read other things, the blogs, the newsletters, et cetera. Um, and, and to Eli's point, it's a dynamic industry. And so there's only so much you can get from a book that's written at one time that captures that, you know, that, that specific uh, venture at that specific time period. And so I think you end up having to rely on, on the blogs and newsletters. Um, yeah. Excellent. So I'm going to sift through some of these questions here, but I do want to ask, you know, you, uh, Kim, you kind of went down the path a little bit on my next question, which were, you know, who are the people you look up to in the industry or whether it's the authors of those newsletters you're talking about, um, people who own and operate certain funds, but are there particular individuals that you see as the role model uh, or the, the creme de la creme of the VC industry that you think everyone should kind of pay attention to? So I'm actually going to I'll start with Eli on this one. Yeah, my, my, my very favorite venture capitalist, Melissa Bradley. Um, she runs 1863 Ventures, um, black, lesbian, and Jewish. Uh, she says, I check off any box that you want me to check off. She is an amazing, like dynamite individual. Like she, she is just moving mountains um, in the space. And then she, she's really phenomenal. Another individual, his name is Faz Bashi. Um, he started off as an angel and, and he was uh, um, the most active life science angel investor, I believe in 2017. He transitioned into venture. Um, the guy is as humble as they come. You know, you would never ever know that this guy has access to literally billions of dollars but just, just mega, mega, mega humble. Um, and, then, and then folks that are involved with the Portfolio Venture Fund, um, that, that's a fund that, that's a new model that's emerged um, to really engage more um, investors at smaller ticket sizes, you know, so it engages more LPs, early ticket sizes like $10,000 and boom, you're an LP in a venture fund. Um, and so they, their more recent fund called Rising America um, is really aimed at black Latinx women and LGBT.